Hello. Welcome, everybody. We're going to start with a welcome message from Franck Plignan, the director of the Step Doctoral School. Okay, good morning, uh, everybody. So it is a real pleasure and a great honor to have uh, Valérie Masson-Delmotte with us today. Um, so this uh, conference is organized by the doctoral school uh, STEP, Sciences de la Terre, de l'Environnement et des Planètes, and mainly by Patricia, Patricia Martinry and Florence Thomas, who is, who is in the back, and with the help also of uh, Xavier Auster from the Collège Doctoral of uh, Université grenoble alpes So this, uh, this conference will be uh, split in uh, two parts, the, the conference itself, and followed by a uh, discussion with the audience. So thank you in advance for your uh, participation. And this uh, discussion will be animated by a group of uh, PhD students that I will uh, let uh, introduce themselves. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, so we are six PhD students from different doctoral schools, from physics to health, and uh, it represents the diversity we have uh, in the audience today, who you are from very different doctoral schools. And as uh, you can see uh, on uh, this graph, so it is very nice to be able to talk uh, among uh, each other uh, on uh, this uh, topic about climate change with uh, a different background from everyone. And uh, we also want to point that uh, among the 240 students here, you have like 100 topics about climate change. So it's very nice to see that you have more and more projects uh, around the, the environment and climate change. And it's encouraging to see uh, to see that and uh, we hope that uh, you will uh, have a nice conference and we want to thank uh, Valérie again for being here and uh, talk uh, to us and with us. Thank you. Oops. So now it's my turn and I will uh, introduce Valérie Masson-Delmotte, but first I also would like to warmly thank the motivated preparation team uh, with the same people as Frank's already acknowledged, by the way. Uh, in the first place, uh, Florence Thomas, the step doctoral school administrator, uh, who really handled most of the practical organization. Uh, Frank and Xavier Oster for their help along the way, and uh, the dynamic group of doctoral students who prepared the discussion. Thank you very much. And it's a very great pleasure to introduce Valérie Masson Delmotte. Uh, and I have heard Valérie saying that uh, one of her motivations for becoming a climatologist uh, was a fascination for clouds during your youth. And so I prepare this uh, world cloud. Uh, in fact, in the um, registration form for this conference, a lot of uh, doctoral students filmed the motivations part. And uh, you know, I, took, I made this quote from the motivations to meet with Valérie. And uh, so it's quite evident from there that uh, Valérie is a world leading expert in climatology. Uh, she is a CEA research director at Laboratoire des Sciences du Climat et de l'Environnement. Uh, she received very numerous distinctions, and I will f uh, cite only a few. Uh, she received uh, the prestigious Milankovic, uh, Mutin Milankovic Medal uh, of the European Geophysical uh, Union in 2020, and uh, she's been highly cited researchers every year since 2014, I think. Uh, I've known Valérie since uh, we were early career scientists because we originate from the same community. And uh, first thing she impressed me with is her huge capacity uh, to synthesize knowledge. And uh, I guess IPCC is the largest knowledge synthesis you can dream of. And she put her uh, 
uh, capacities uh, and expertise at the service of IPCC for almost 20 years, I am, if I'm not mistaken. And she was uh, named uh, lead author uh, in the chapter on paleoclimates on the fourth assessment report uh, of IPCC. So this was back in 2004. Uh, the assessment report came out in 2007, and at that time she was associated uh, with the Peace Nobel Prize received with uh, IPCC for that report. Uh, in the next, next cycle, she was uh, coordinating lead author of one chapter and also uh, of the summaries of working group one uh, assessments. And now she's co-chair of this working group one, which deals with the physical basis of climate change. Uh, and uh, the, the report from this uh, working group one uh, was released on August 21, but since that Valérie was still very active on the other parts of the report, and the synthesis report just came out last Monday. Uh, Valérie also has a long-term involvement in uh, the dissemination of science to the general public in a very wide diversity of ways from uh, writing books for children to training the French government members uh, to climate issues. And uh, I would like also to underline her long-lasting societal en engagement. Uh, she distinguished herself early on in fighting uh, climato-skepticism. And uh, more recently, she campaigned for, uh, for uh, an increase in teaching hours in climate science in high schools. Uh, she's a member of the Haut Conseil pour le Climat. It's an independent body uh, that assesses the public policies uh, for, the for uh, uh, France uh, in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And her global notoriety led her to be cited as one of the 100 most influenced people in the world by the American Times Magazine in 2022. Uh, uh, so although she is very, very solicited, <laughs> especially this day, uh, she very quickly accepted our, our invitation for this conference, uh, primarily designed for uh, doctoral students and early career scientists. Thanks a million, Valérie. And uh, you are here from all disciplines, so that's a very nice thing. Uh, and uh, yeah, Valérie also took the time to interact a bit with uh, the doctoral students, uh, which organized the discussion. Thank you very much. And uh, so I think everybody here is uh, happy to take part in this great opportunity. <laughs> Good morning and thank you very much for this invitation. Um, thank you also for choosing to have your professional career part starting with science. And in my view, science is critical to empower. And that's what I see within the IPCC reports. Science to empower, to make sense of where we are, what are the possible futures, and what can be done in the near term. And that's exactly the structure of the last IPCC synthesis report that was released last Monday. One IPCC cycle is a, um, a set of reports. We've started this last cycle in 2015, and we are finishing in July with the election of the next bureau, IPCC chair, vice chairs, co-chairs. We are charged to supervise reports, and these reports are only possible because worldwide, the scientific communi community advances knowledge. So the raw material for all IPCC reports are publications, and there were tens of thousands of publications assessed in each of the reports that has been released. The particularity is that for a special report, you have a hundred of authors who assess the evidence from the peer review literature, and then distillate the state of knowledge. What is strengthened? What is emergent with a lower level of, of confidence? And where are the knowledge gaps? And that's what you can find in each report. And from reports that have several hundreds of pages for the special reports, several thousands of pages for the main working group reports, we distillate the key findings which we perceive to be policy relevant. And this has be, to be done in a neutral, non-prescriptive way. That's really the, the mandate that we have. 
So in this cycle, we released a report on global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius. This was asked to us by the uh, United Nations uh, Convention on Climate Change when they developed the Paris Agreement in Paris at COP21. At that time, we showed already that limiting warming close to 1.5 degrees Celsius would be a major challenge. Five years later, you will see that the challenge is even larger. We released a, re a special report on the ocean and cryosphere in a changing climate. One chapter is specifically important for this region, mountains. It shows how we depend on the state of the cryosphere for many activities as well as for ecosystems. It shows that in the ocean, in polar regions, in mountains, the slow response of the ocean, of the cryosphere, will force us to anticipate, to adapt, so that our societies can be resilient because some changes are unavoidable over hundreds to thousands of years. We released a special report on climate change and land, which addresses issues of biodiversity, adaptation to climate change, storing carbon over land, or avoiding greenhouse gas emissions from the food system, and food security. And today, more than never, Food security is a vital issue for humanity, and climate change is adding a threat to this challenge. So the synthesis report builds on these three special reports, as well as the main working group report, the state of climate, the physical science basis, understanding where we are now, what has caused the changes to date, what are the possible futures, and climate information to inform adaptation, and how, from a physical basis, you can limit warming. It has been complemented by a focus, of course, on what matters for society, impacts and risks, as well as adaptation options. And the last volume is on mitigation, so how to reduce greenhouse gas emissions while allowing everyone um, a livable future. The synthesis report builds on the approved summaries for policymakers of all these reports in a very compact way. It has a long report of 100 pages and a summary for policymakers of around 40 pages. Last week, we've spent 133 hours with delegates from all governments, at your seats, basically, scrutinizing every word, every figure, every sentence of the report. Everything which was scientifically grounded stayed. I'm really glad about that. During this approval process, the scientists always have, always have the last word. However, if there's no consensus between the governments, there's a risk of losing an important scientific matter. So a lot of care is paid to adding elements from the longer reports that matter for every region of the world with different geopolitical sensitivities. And the process was slow because the content of the report matters for every country, every region of the world, and we are touching all the politically sensitive issues increasing severity of impacts and losses and damages, inadequacy of action to date with a gap in adaptation, a gap in mitigation, and a gap in finance. And the report, despite the fact that it, it is inconvenient for policymakers, it is true, but it is a reality check that matters and is scientifically grounded. So I summarize this report in three words, seriousness of where we are, urgency of taking widespread action in all sectors, changing scale of action, and knowledge to inform action. So I will just scroll out uh, through several of the key figures of the summary for policymakers and the longer report, not all, and highlight the key messages that as scientists we wanted to reflect. These are not the exact words of the documents. These are really the key messages from a work we do with specialists of communications to help us communicate our findings in plain language. So despite advances in adaptation, planning and implementation, it remains fragmented. Despite progress of legal frameworks, laws, that now concern about half of global greenhouse gas emissions, despite having 18 countries, including France, with a decrease and sustained decrease in greenhouse gas emissions, the pace and scale of what has been done so far and current plans, including pledges from governments by 2025 and 2030, 
are insufficient to tackle climate change, and the current trends are incompatible with a sustainable and equitable world. First thing, greenhouse gas emissions resulting from human activities continue to increase. They are shown here aggregated in CO2 equivalent. The main driver of warming to date are emissions of carbon dioxide, primarily from fossil fuels, coal, gas and oil. They have continued to increase but a bit slower than previously. Second driver is change in land use, in particular deforestation. It has slowed down, but it continues to be too large. And amongst the other greenhouse gases, what matters most are emissions of methane. It's the second driver of warming to date, with a direct warming effect and an indirect effect through air quality as a precursor of the formation of ozone, a greenhouse gas and pollutant toxic for plants and forests. When we say human activities are responsible for greenhouse gas emissions, it's not all human activities, and they are unequal historical contributions. On the, on the panel here, you can see the cumulative emissions, because cumulative CO2 emissions are how they affect climate now and in the future. And you can see a disproportionate weight of historically industrialized regions, North America or Europe. When you look at emissions per capita today, per person, that's the second graph, you can see a disproportionate um, responsibility for those living in North America, the Middle East, Eastern Asia, Europe. And you can see that emissions per person are extremely small in regions such as Africa or Southern Asia. The 10% persons with the largest emissions account for 35% of global greenhouse gas emissions. They have a larger capacity to act. Half of the world's population have so low emissions that they only account for 15% of emissions. So when we talk about climate action, it has to come for those with the largest historical and today's emissions. You can see that in the report, the notion of climate justice is prevalent. And we flag that where we are today is the result of long-term trends of unsustainable use of fossil fuel energy, land use, land use change, lifestyles and patterns of production and consumption between and within countries, as well as between individuals within each country. With this slide, I want to pay tribute to the pioneer role of Claude Lorius. It was very sad for me to hear uh, the, the news of him passing away. Uh, he has been a pioneer of the study of past greenhouse gases from ice core records in Antarctica. And this information has allowed us to feel how much human activities have deeply altered uh, the atmospheric global composition. So you can see that since uh, the Industrial Revolution in 1850, global greenhouse gas concentrations have increased rapidly. And they continue to increase because our emissions continue to rise. The knowledge is clear. Human activities have unequivocally caused global warming. This curve is um, uh, the warming observed at the Earth's surface. For the decade 2011 to 2020, 2020 um, we estimated that the level of warming compared to pre-industrial was around 1.1 degrees Celsius. We were able in the synthesis to update that just by two more years, and it's now 1.15 degrees. This panel explains the results of what we call attribution studies. We look at natural climate variability. It does not explain any accumulation of heat in the climate system. We look at solar and volcanic activity that can affect the Earth's energy budget. But despite their role in modulating um, human-caused long-term trends, they don't explain any accumulation of heat in the climate system. And when we look at the assessment of human influence, you can see that in orange, our best estimate is equal to the warming observed to date. The warming due to greenhouse gases is partly offset by the umbrella or cooling effect driven by pollution particles. And in the last 10 years, through progress in um, air pollution control, more greenhouse gases, a bit less pollution particles, in particular in Europe and North America, the two drivers go in the same direction. 
So the impacts that we observe in every region of the world, they are driven by multiple physical climate conditions, which increase with every increment of warming to date. So for instance, increases in hot extremes in every region overland and marine heat waves as well. And it's virtually certain it is a result of human-caused climate change. We alter the chemical composition of the ocean that absorbs about a quarter of our emissions per year, and this leads to acidification. Warming leads to glacier retreat, melt of the Greenland ice sheet, faster flow around Antarctica, an expansion of the ocean and global sea level rise, which has accelerated in the last decades. A warmer climate increases the intensity of heavy precipitation events. It's increasing by the effect of both sea level rise and more intense precipitation, compound flooding over coasts. Warmer and drier conditions through an increase in soil moisture droughts, agricultural droughts, also fuels an increase in fire weather. So these characteristics will intensify in every region with further warming. And the results in terms of impact is not a matter of hazards. I just mentioned hazards in a way. But the result is the outcome of the interplay between hazards, exposure of ecosystems and populations, and their vulnerability. And a stri striking visual here shows that those who contribute the least today to greenhouse gas emissions live in highly vulnerable contexts. Today, 3.5 billion of people live in contexts highly vulnerable to climate change with a lack of basic infrastructure and livelihoods for small-scale farming or communities of fishermen that are sensitive uh, to climate. So what we observe as a result uh, is that adverse impacts from human-caused climate change are increasing in intensity, scale, and they will continue to, in to intensify with every further increment of warming. So we see that it affects water availability and food production with shocks uh, on both agricultural yields as well as productivity of, um, of animal and livestock. It affects fisheries and aquaculture. With heat, there are direct effects on human health, morbidity and mor mortality. An increase in infectious diseases, especially with flooding. Uh, issues associated with uh, mental health, in particular for those who are um, subject to forced displacement uh, due to the intensification of extreme events. There are damages uh, increasingly in cities and infrastructures, uh, for instance, due to a higher proportion of the most uh, inten intense tropical cyclones. And we see widespread changes in ecosystems, uh, overland, for aquatic ecosystems and in the ocean. Changes in phenology, changes in species ranges, degradation of ecosystems, increased mortality, for instance, coral reefs or trees uh, for hotter conditions. Half of the studied species over land and in the ocean are moving just to try to keep with their climate zones. Scientific advances, they give us a better understanding of not just where we are and what are the causes of what is observed, but also what the future will look like depending on the choices that we make today. So this is um, a short summary of where we are today, the warming shown with one year, one stripe, from blue to red. And then five contrasted futures. This is the assessed response of global temperature to five illustrative socioeconomic pathways that imply very high, high, intermediate, low, or very low emissions. Intermediate emissions is close to current trends. So a stagnation of global greenhouse gas emissions during several decades and a slow decrease. In that case, the goals of the Paris Agreement, you know, limiting warming well below 2 degrees and close to 1.5 degrees, will be endangered. We would exceed 1.5 degrees, averaged over 20 years, by the beginning of the 2030s, so next decade, and we would exceed 2 degrees of global warming by the 2050, with warming close to 3 degrees at the end of the century and continuing. We cannot exclude higher levels of warming in the case of further investments in fossil fuels, or if the climate responds in the upper tail of what, can, what we can assess, 
or if the feedbacks from the carbon cycle are larger than what we know today. But we can also alter this pattern, and with a sharp reduction in global greenhouse gas emissions, we can have a discernible effect on the warming trend within 20 years. So the future, it's already there for the next decades. We have to anticipate and put an emphasis on adaptation and support those most vulnerable. But on the midterm, by the middle of the century, it really depends on the cho choices that we make today. And as you can see, we have added different generations here, just to highlight the notion also of generational justice, which is important when considering the outcome of inaction, or because we all feel empathy for different generations, a strong motivation to change scale in what we do now. So this is just to show that with every increment of warming, every tenth of degree, every half a degree, we will have different characteristics in every region. This is to illustrate hot extremes, how the temperature of the hottest day in a year will change depending on the level of global warming, an increase almost everywhere, and in particular in temperate regions or regions of Mediterranean climate. Uh, the upper panel shows, with every increment of warming, how soil moisture in annual mean will change. Everywhere where it is in red color or orange color, these are regions we, where there will be a drying of soils, so an aridification process associated with warming. Around the Mediterranean Sea, in South Africa, areas of Australia or Asia, as, uh, Latin America, for instance, as well as uh, the Amazon region. And despite the annual mean changes here, in most of the regions, a warmer climate means an increase in heavy precipitation events with an increase in the percentage um, of the wettest day amount of precipitation per year. So what we need to prepare for is an intensification of the water cycle and its variability with more frequent, more severe, very wet and very dry seasons, very wet and very dry events. Every increment of warming will also affect, of course, ecosystems and biodiversity. This is a, a modeling result for 30,000 species, mostly of animals and sea grasses as well. And what it shows is that the areas most at risk of species loss, with the hypothesis that species stay in the same area, you can see that there will be a risk of losing the diversity of life particularly strong in the tropics and for low levels of warming. And with higher levels of warming, it's more widespread. And this does not account for all the aspects of a changing climate, such as the cryosphere, it's not included. If you look at uh, human health, uh, one core issue to consider are the limits of human physiology. And there are conditions of heat and humidity which make it impossible to have a physical activity outdoors. You can see the pattern today of the number of days per year where this occurs. And you can see that with every increment of warming, these um, fatal conditions uh, will increase first in the tropics and then uh, accounting for larger regions. So these are aspects that can cause more severe uh, cascading risks. You have seen that this year, this last year in spring in Pakistan or India, very severe heat People who have physical outdoor work, um, building sector or farming, could not work. At the same time, it's damaging for crop yields. And these two effects uh, affect the livelihoods, the income of the, of the families, and it affects the price of food locally. So these are uh, traps that can increase poverty and malnutrition. The major challenges for uh, food production are illustrated here for the yields of maize with the current cultivars that are used, so assuming no specific further adaptation. And you can see a warmer climate will mean a decrease in the yields of maize, which is one of the key um, crops uh, worldwide. You can also see that warming in the ocean implies a decrease in the yields of fisheries. It is already observed in the tropics. It will increase with warming and don't take the green for um, um, a sign of optimism, there's huge uncertainty of the outcomes in the Arctic, 
taking into consideration uh, ecosystem changes that remain hard to anticipate. So losses and damages, they will be part of our future and they will hit the most vulnerable ecosystems, coral reefs for instance, and people living in highly vulnerable contexts, especially hard. But the actions we take now, we make a difference. Planning for a diversification of the food system, agroecological methods, developing new types of cultivars that can operate in a warmer climate, conservation, protection, restoration of natural ecosystems. This is critical to give them a better chance of resilience. When you look at future warming possibilities and we look at the outcome of risk assessments, we can show that risks increase with every increment of warming for unique systems, weather events that are extreme, the distribution of impacts there, global aggregated effects like for economic and food systems, and the risks of uh, abrupt changes for singular systems. Our report shows that for a, a given level of warming, we now assess the risks to be larger than assessed just eight years ago. So this is the outcome of improved knowledge. And the risks differ by systems. And I just want to illustrate, previously I put an emphasis on services from ecosystems such as food. But there's also a responsibility that, that we have to preserve ecosystems and nature for what it is, not just for the services that they give, is, give us. So we illustrate here for levels of warming the risks for coastal and marine ecosystems. We also illustrate them here for land systems. For high levels of warming, the natural things, ocean and land, will be gradually more, less efficient at absorbing the same fraction of our emissions. This is illustrated here by the risk of carbon loss due to the degradation of land ecosystems. Today, land and soil store about 31% of our CO2 emissions per year. Limiting warming at low levels is critical because then you avoid these additional carbon cycle feedbacks. You also have more space to build on ecosystem for ecosystem-based adaptation, greening cities, restoring coastal ecosystems to limit land erosion or to limit uh, uh, issues associated with water scarcity. Sea level rise, it is unavoidable because of the slow response time of glaciers, the deep ocean ice sheets. But you can see that choices in terms of global emissions make a whole difference. By the second half of the century, a factor of two, if we limit warming at low levels or for high levels of warming, and it continues over hundreds to thousands of years. You can also see that we illustrate with a dashed line here our deep uncertainty, in particular for possible tipping points associated with the Antarctic ice sheet. We cannot exclude that. It matters to take that into account for coastal planning for critical infrastructures. So in this report, we provide uh, the estimate of a maximum uh, plausible outcome if such instabilities occur. And we need to advance knowledge on this matter uh, as uh, on other related matters. And here we show that for different coastal geographies, uh, the risks will increase, of course, with the magnitude and rate of sea level rise. And you can also see that they can be decreased with response options. Um, it includes uh, different options, such as coastal protection with ecosystems, with hard infrastructures, but it will also include either responses, which mean retreating from the coast, which pose many difficult democratic issues on, of how to do it well. And if we look at uh, health, or if we look at food insecurity, of course, a first key aspect is the level of warming. But our socioeconomic choices make a difference. If we invest in health systems, if we plan for adaptation of the health systems, we can limit the effect of extreme heat on morbidity or mortality. And for food insecurity, if we have a world with low population growth, reduced inequalities, resilient food production systems, and high adaptive capacity, if we also preserve land for agricultural purposes, we can in fact limit the risks for food insecurity even for an intermediate level of warming. So it's not just a story of climate change. It's a story of the choices that we make 
and can allow to have a livable world despite unavoidable warming in the future. So in 2018, we highlighted the unprecedented scale of the challenge if we would like uh, to limit warming very close to today. Five years later, you have seen the challenge has become even greater. And I illustrate here with this graph. This is the geophysical constraints from climate science on what will drive future warming. You can see cumulative CO2 emissions and the close relationship with historical warming in grey and then future warming with the different scenarios. So what will matter is the cumulative CO2 emissions in the future. The good news is that if we manage to reach net zero CO2 emissions globally, there would not be more warming to come. Okay? The inertia is not the inertia of the climate system for warming. It's the inertia associated with cumulative CO2 emissions. And what we show uh, is the limit, the remaining carbon budget, if we would like to limit warming to 1.5 degrees or 2 degrees with different chance chances of success. What is striking is that if emissions at the global scale stay at the level of 2019, within around 10 years, we will have exhausted that remaining carbon budget. We also show that fossil fuel infrastructure that exists today, in particular for fossil fuel production of electricity in the world, if it is used over the planned lifetime without early ending or further abatement, that will exhaust the remaining budget to limit warming close to 1.5. And if we also consider the planned infrastructure, it will uh, deplete almost everything remaining to limit warming below 2 degrees. So, Maybe the most important message is now. The urgency is to stop building new fossil fuel power plants, new fossil fuel infrastructures. And everything you invest with a fossil fuel infrastructure, thermal cars or gas heating or uh, power plants or industry using fossil fuels, you lock in future emissions and you lock in future warming levels. And that's really clear from geophysics. So let's look at where we are. In black, the greenhouse gas emissions that have continued to increase. The whiskers bars show the level in 2015 when the Paris Agreement was signed. And the second bar in 2019, four years later. They have continued to increase. The bar that appears with a dashed vertical line in grey shows the outcome of the pledges from all governments within the Paris Agreement by 2030. If all these pledges formulated before the invasion of Ukraine by Russia would turn true, there would be only a small decrease of global greenhouse gas emissions. And this is absolutely not at scale with what is needed. So there's a gap between action and what is needed, a gap between pledges and what is needed, and also a gap between the pledges and what is actually implemented. If we would be serious with limiting warming, there is a need for limiting warming to two degrees of a quarter percent decrease between now and 2030 globally. And if we wanted to keep a chance to limit warming close to 1.5, uh, this would mean 45% uh, less by 2030. I just want to flag that it also includes um, sharp reductions in methane emissions, typically by around 30% in this decade. And finally, if you want to reach net zero CO2 emissions, there are different ways of doing that. There are different ways, current trends, but strengthen. You can play on the demand side, and you can play on sustainable pathways. You could put a strong emphasis on renewable energy. But the less you act on the demand side, the more you will need net negative emissions to counterbalance remaining emissions from sectors that are hard to abate. And the issue of net negative emissions is a challenge. If we don't act now and we overshoot a level of warming of 1.5 and would like to go back, this only relies on the ability to have net negative uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the second part of the century with questions of cost, feasibility, and risks associated with methodologies to take up CO2 from the air and store it on the long term. But with rapid action, it is possible to build a livable and sustainable future through climate resilient development. 
So that's a strong message from the report, looking at conditions that enable this inclusive governance, building on the diverse forms of knowledges and values, reorienting finance to support sustainability, um, integration, uh, integrated public policies across sectors, ecosystem stewardship, and building to the maximum of the win-wins between adaptation and sustainability, reducing greenhouse gas emissions and their co-benefits. But there are also strong barriers, in particular the perception of inequity of what can be put in place. There are economic, institutional and social barriers, as well as capacities that you need to have, new skills, new mindsets. The approach to climate action in silos, while it should be integrated in all uh, public policies, is a strong barrier for effective action. And there's a strong lack of finance by a factor of three to six between what would be needed to deploy the solutions that exist and what is already available despite the availability globally of capital and liquidities. So let's now look quickly at the options. I will not give you the whole list. But what we stress in the report is that there are available, effective, low-cost options that have already been tested and could reduce global greenhouse gas emissions by a factor of two if they would be all deployed. They are also effective, tested, adaptation responses options with multiple benefits for society. So in, you can see and you can find in the reports this summary of the adaptation options by system and the mitigation options by system for energy, for how we use um, land and water and for the food system, as well as uh, uh, for uh, urban systems, health, and then societal choices. What is clearly shown is that to strengthen adaptation, you need social safety nets, and you could include adaptation to a changing climate in social policies in a much more effective way. If you look, for instance, here at the transport sector in France, it's the first emi emittive sector, about 30% of emissions. You also see that there's no one size fits all. There are multiple options brought together that can help uh, to divide by two the emissions of the transport sector small eff efficient thermi vehicles, small, uh, small batteries and low carbon electricity electric vehicles, public transportation infrastructures that allow active mobilities, which are in the hands of uh, uh, urban and national strategies. And it's not just these small um, options that work, it's also for cities working on the urban forms to limit, for instance, the demand for transport to make the best use of energy efficiency and this is just to illustrate the importance of systemic approaches and not one-by-one uh, one, uh, response options. The demand part is critical. Uh, in France, we use the term sobriété, but in the IPCC assessments, it's the term sufficiency that is considered. So avoiding demands in energy, building, materials, use of water, use of land, while allowing everyone to live decently within planetary boundaries. And the demand side is critical. Integrating that in public policies, but also in the design of goods and products and services, has the pot potential to contribute to around 40 to 70% of the reduction emissions that are needed by 2050. So it's not just technology and innovation. It's not just building on ecosystems and what we call sometimes nature-based solutions. It's also um, playing with the demand side that gives the maximum possibility to reduce emissions, maintain ecosystems at the global scale. And the report shows clearly that prioritizing fairness, climate justice, inclusivity, and sharing diverse knowledges, uh, not just scientific knowledge, but knowledge from practitioners, from those who live in different contexts, and integrating different values um, is the way forward to lead to sustainable outcomes and support the scale of transformations that are needed. So just to finish, I want to illustrate how science can empower us to understand and to take action, not just on looking at the low-hanging fruits that are available, but thinking carefully by a portfolio of the diverse options that are available, how to maximize the co-benefits, how to protect those most vulnerable, and how to scale up uh, action, because the choices we make now, or those we don't make, uh, 
they will reverberate, not just in the next decades, but for instance, for sea level rise, for hundreds and even thousands of years. Thank you. So now we will go on the discussion. So the aim is not only to ask questions to Valérie, but you can also interact uh, between you if you can answer the question or share your experience. The idea is to speak, uh, to get questions uh, on the presentation uh, and specification on what Valérie presents, but we can also talk about how the IPCC works more, uh, about the professional experience of Valérie or uh, the fact that we are in PhD and facing those uh, challenges. So how does it affect the way we, we do science? Uh, and how it is to be a researcher with such uh, conclusions? So all these teams can be, can be a teams of question if you have them. Um, and so if you are not confident by speaking in English with the microphone, there is some post-its and papers. You can write the question on it and the two, my two colleagues will tell the question. Uh, so if you have question, it's the time. Hi. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have question, simple question. Uh, you seem to believe about uh, science neutrality and uh, specifically about uh, IPCC uh, neutrality. Uh, for instance, about uh, the methodologies or um, the solution assessment, uh, why? Thank you, Valerie, for, for your presentation. I just have a more outside, not scientifically question, but when you present these reports, your commissions, IPCC, to political agents, now it will be quite naive how they react to what are like their expertises, how they can process this data, how can process and understand the possible futures, and about the carbon neutral by 2050 by European Union, what is like the big challenges because they say in 2050 we'll be carbon neutral but it's not for the 1.5 degrees it could be for four in their that this is what is is how they can react and which reforms they need we need to do today to avoid this uh, catastrophe Thank you for your presentation. Um, it's a great work and we will obviously need the uh, knowledge to get through action, but um, where is the action today? Uh, I know it's maybe not the purpose of the agency, but how can you articulate uh, your work with, um, with uh, action to implementation? Um, maybe it's not uh, the work, your work, but Maybe we think uh, a structure or something to force um, governments to implement uh, the needed policy to challenge climate changes. Climate changes, uh, challenges. Thank you. Okay, so uh, the first question is very broad, and it's not just for the IPCC, the question about science neutrality. Um, for IPCC, there's a clear mandate that was developed in the 1990s, 
Uh, my perception is that many of the scientists who contribute to IPCC reports, this is already a form of engagement, taking time outside of your own research activities uh, to collectively uh, develop uh, um, an, an assessment of the state of knowledge. And I think it's changing everyone involved, uh, especially through not looking at a narrow area that we know best, uh, but at a broad state of knowledge and um, with a formalization of how to do a rigorous assessment. Um, it's hard after doing that to not use confidence language when you do anything. Um, the second thing is, um, my take home message is that um, the, the assessment is most rigorous and objective when we have a diverse group of authors. Uh, to try to use a metaphor to avoid a boys club <laughs> um, of scientists who have already worked together, think about the same, have the same ways of looking at the evidence. And so when we have a renewal across generations, diversity amongst regions of the world, um, um, gender diversity, uh, as, as well as um, different scientific communities uh, working together. This helps to sharpen the assessment and avoid, um, how to explain that, unconscious biases, also in the way we look at the state of knowledge. So here, what, we, what I show here is, uh, in a way, the least common denominator. This is what makes it its way through the filter of approval by governments, several times in fact. But within the reports you can see a diversity of ways of looking at the same information. And what I think particularly useful is understanding what are the barriers, what are the obstacles and what are the power relationships that block uh, um, deep transformation. And I don't know if it fits with your question, but I think it's how collectively we can also look at um, the root causes of where we are and the values changes that are lead associated with the scale of the changes that could limit um, the consequences of a changing climate. And different, for instance, economical theories are reflected in the report, including degrowth, for instance. Second question was about policymakers. <laughs> Good question. Um, so we write summary for policymakers, but most of them don't read it. A few exceptions, I have to say, including here. Uh, then the second thing is that um, what matters is that the advisors of policymakers can make a summary fact sheet of what matters for them. So what is needed are mediators, people who understand the science and can explain it in the world that are understandable for different contexts. For example, the, the report on the physical science basis, we wrote uh, a joint um, summary with the International Association of Actuaries. These are the persons who assess risks of any investment and advise governments. So this was a way for them to take ownership of our physical science knowledge and transfer it, for instance, to do climate stress tests uh, in various uh, uh, decision-making processes. I described the IPCC process as a co-construction. We first listened to the needs expressed by the governments before even starting uh, a cycle or for each report. And then we assess the state of knowledge associated with these themes that have, they have themselves identified. They contribute through bureau members or authors. They contribute in the review process as well. Um, and at the end, they endorse uh, the summaries for policymakers. But this process, we don't have an equivalent at other scales. We don't have a process where the French government or the parliament endorses the state of knowledge or a city council or a regional authorities. So I think we need other spaces, in fact, uh, uh, scientific council, advisory bodies, local, uh, GIEC or <laughs> uh, GREC, uh, systems that create uh, um, um, trust, in fact, between local decision makers and the scientific community, in particular uh, because the information needed at local scales has to be developed. It's not always available. So one aspect is IPCC, but there are many other aspects uh, um, that uh, are important. And I think the third question was about where action is taking place. So what I have not see, said is that um, public policies are increasingly um, including climate action. About half of the world's emissions are covered by regulatory frameworks or laws, and we know what works. Uh, from the Kyoto Protocol to other aspects, we know that this has led to avoiding emitting around between two and six uh, billion tons CO2 per year. The issue is to broaden the use of these frameworks that work uh, um, and to uh, uh, increase their ambition. It also includes, for instance, uh, changes in fiscality um, that takes into account the redistribution effects uh, 
typically a carbon tax and redistribution, which is uh, critical for this being uh, uh, socially uh, uh, acceptable. There's increasing action at the scales of subnational authorities and cities, in particular associated with uh, adaptation. And in fact, the next IPCC report, uh, special report, it has already been agreed, will be on cities and climate change, given the importance at the city scales of integrating, in particular, um, reducing emissions and uh, resilience, um, risk management and adaptation. And then what has ramped up is uh, the inclusion of uh, aspects related to climate action um, in business sectors through, in fact, um, uh, uh, policy contexts that are imposed to the business sector. And it has also increased on the finance sector. It's not perfect. Uh, it's slowly taking shape. Uh, and in particular, there are issues associated with transparency and reporting that are quite critical to sharpen and make consistent uh, with uh, the state of knowledge. And finally, the last point I wanted to um, emphasize is the implementation of national climate change committees, so in the role of independent authorities that assess um, action to date and make recommendations. Um, so this is uh, taking shape, and it's also a way to have uh, independent fact-checking um, on what has been achieved and uh, how to make it more effective. And finally, I, I cannot speak about EU Carbon Neutral 2050, but for instance, for France, if you look at the goal of net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, it is compatible with 1.5. It's not CO2 only, it's all greenhouse gases, so much earlier than what would be needed at the global scale, and it's consistent with uh, equity dimensions that uh, can be considered. The issue is, uh, are we on track to... Uh, to uh, uh, reach this goal, and uh, I have to say that uh, not yet. Thank you for your clear presentation. Uh, I have a question related to um, the nature, uh, because uh, you had a slide where you mentioned the decrease of biodiversity and the possibility of uh, species going extinct, and uh, there were already several species in the 1.5 scenario. And then later when you mentioned the uh, possible mitigations, I feel like uh, they, they target to lower future uh, warming and they somehow mitigate the effect on humans. But I don't see what we can do for, for the wildlife. Like we cannot ask the wildlife to move to the cities and of course they are less likely to uh, develop tools to somehow combat climate change. So my question would be more if we can um, reasonably do something for the environment uh, in the scenarios that are mm, we foresee to happen. And just a second question, uh, in the emissions of France, uh, do you calculate also the emissions of the exported, uh, imported items? Thank you. Um, hello, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I have a big, uh, small qu uh, question about the increased uh, food insecurity that you mentioned. Uh, in fact, um, what uh, did we calculate some uh, in some way the fact the possibility that there would be more food insecurity within a decarbonized world, as in a, um, as in the the, the the world of today? I'm um, thinking, about, for example, about uh, one year ago in Ukraine when the Ukrainian wheat was stopped. Um, due for military reasons, uh, in the, maybe in 2015 it would be stopped, but not for military, rather for uh, lack of uh, oil, or because we for uh, for uh, environmental reasons. So yeah, what would be worse? That's that's the only questions. Thanks. Thank you for your presentation. I have a question about. Um, uh, the role of uh, science, you highlighted the role of science, and what do you think about the other movements about activism, for instance? Um, I think about the attacks against paintings. Is it necessary, a necessary to, to make it change, to make the people aware, um, maybe that comes from the bottom and not from the top of the society? What do you think about yeah, activism? Hello. 
um, here. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I read um, an article a few uh, months ago of a journalist that is um, rather famous and uh, he's been talking to different people over I think 20 years about climate change and their perception of the future and he said that he could separate uh, people in two categories uh, wizards or druids wizards that look at the future in uh, with optimism in the sense that we will find new technology and new uh, f forms of adaptation uh, in the sense that we can still have an, a growing economy and very good technologies that will uh, fight climate change and the druids that look at the future in a more of a degrowth um, fashion so um, perhaps not uh, in in technology but uh, looking in the to the past and to other types of uh, ways to mitigate our uh, impacts so my question is are you a wizard or are you a druid So you, uh, the first question was uh, uh, addressing nature. Uh, so if you look at the equivalent of IPCC for uh, biodiversity and ecosystems, IPBES, you can see that the first pressures on biodiversity and ecosystems are local pressures, uh, destru destruction of habitats, local pollutions, etc. So climate change uh, is the first driver of uh, pressure on ecosystems and, and speeches. It's going to ramp up if we do not limit the scale and the speed of warming. So what can be done is clearly to reduce all the other pressures, think conservation differently, include ecosystems in the way we take decisions so that when we deploy adaptation solutions, we build on ecosystems as much as possible. Um, and also when we try to reduce green, no, when we succeed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, we also build on ecosystems and avoid um, um, climate solutions that could be damaging uh, for uh, biodiversity or ecosystems. So it's a way of uh, um, better informing decision making uh, to avoid uh, side effects that would be damaging uh, in this direction. And in, fa in fact we uh, released an IPBES IPCC workshop report two years ago which was the first time we looked at the issues together. And this is a recurrent question in fact from uh, local uh, policymakers. Uh, to be informed on how to not do it wrong, uh, which means take into account the climate dimension, the biodiversity dimension, and the social dimensions in the best possible way. Um, so this is what I wanted to stress. Um, I just want to mention that in Europe we use the term, and it's promoted by uh, UICN, nature-based solutions. It was uh, strongly pushed back uh, by some governments, in particular from Africa, which uh, perceive this framing uh, um, to be um, a way of justifying land grabbing. So in particular, you know that some uh, uh, sectors such as aviation, they will struggle to reduce emissions. The only way now to reduce emissions from the airline sector is to reduce demand and plane travel. The other uh, efficiency or small inputs of uh, um, biomass made fuels uh, has a limited potential. So they build on um, buying offsets uh, uh, in particular, um, uh, reforestation or afforestation, and where the land rights are most fragile is often in Africa, um, where uh, it is really perceived to be a, a new type of land uh, grabbing uh, that can be extremely damaging. I want to flag that the IPCC reports are very clear on what is not a nature-based solution. It's really uh, dis described in a box in the ecosystem chapter and in the African chapter. And it flags that replacing a pristine ecosystem uh, with traditional land use, such as a savanna, uh, by a, a, a monoculture of whatever <laughs> biomass is put there, is not a nature-based solution. And um, the other thing was about uh, food insecurity, and you are right that um, there is really a challenge of placing a strong emphasis on food security while thinking the transformations that are needed. So many options that reduce the environmental environmental footprint of agriculture, such as agroecology, agroforestry, or sustainable intensification, can have, in fact, uh, uh, effects on crop yields or effects on the area that is needed to produce the same amount of crops. And more broadly, um, not just food insecurity, but pressure on land, I think, has to be given a highest priority. 
I flagged on the um, ways to reduce food insecurity in a warming world. The issue of preserving uh, agricultural land, this is clearly critical. We need land to produce food for animals, feed for animals, food for people, uh, material for clothes. Uh, we need land uh, to preserve ecosystems and biodiversity. We increasingly need land to produce biomass uh, for material, for energy, and to store carbon. And that's a very uh, challenging uh, decision-making process. It's not yet at, uh, taken uh, seriously enough in all uh, public policies uh, I have been able to look at. Um, so it's not a simple answer, but you, you point to a really critical aspect of sustainability. Then the question was about the role of science. <laughs> So it, it's not, uh, and the role of activism. So if you look at a historical perspective, all major societal changes involved um, scientists working with governments, if it involved any scientific understanding, but other forms of expression in society, including uh, radical forms. Just look at, for instance, uh, the fight for gender equity. Uh, it had multiple forms including people within mainstream movements, as well as uh, activists who even destroyed paintings at the time uh, to express uh, rage and also to uh, uh, push for a more radical action. So it, it would be uh, ridiculous to not assume uh, that shifts in society operate by well-informed governments uh, who look at the future and who are bold and brave and will hurt interest in place. It's not how it happens. And then my personal um, reflection is the following. As a co-chair of IPCC, I have to build trust about science. I have to be able to speak to people with different values and visions of the world. You know, when you release a report with uh, Saudi Arabia or India or South Africa or Brazil, uh, US and two different governments during this cycle, or Russia, um, you know, you have to speak to everyone and take into account the values and visions of the world. And I think it's the same within also one country. Um, if science is perceived to be biased or, or um, um, not solidly grounded in evidence, you also have the risk of, of uh, uh, destroying the trust that people with different sets of values uh, put in science. And the worst I have seen uh, is one of the major government uh, parties in the US making climate denial as part of their core set of values. For me, this is the worst uh, for the democratic debate. So I think we also have to work hard across the political lines, beliefs, values, systems to give a special emphasis on what science is uh, and build trust on that. Um, and then the last question was about how I see the future. <laughs> if I'm a wizard or I could not understand the exact word used. <laughs> um, I think we, there are multiple ways of seeing the changes in every country. And I had the chance by working on IPCC reports to increase my carbon footprint uh, and travel in various cities in the world that have hosted author meetings or plenary sessions. I have met people who are on the front line of losses and damages. I have seen what they experience, I have heard their words. I cannot be optimistic. I know that there will be a lot of suffering. It is there, it will continue. Particularly striking in w is when you lose um, your cultural heritage due to a changing climate, because this makes the core of a society. When you have to leave the places where your ancestors have left before. I've seen that, I've heard their words. I cannot be a, a blind optimist. And then what gives me strength uh, is uh, the diversity of people who take action at different stages. Um, I'm optimist uh, when I see advances in innovation and technology that give the same service uh, with uh, much lower emissions or zero emissions. I'm very glad that I can use an electric bike and no mobile oil due to the pressure from oil producing countries in the approval of the first IPCC reports. I came out of that and I thought I will do my best to never myself have to buy oil anymore. <laughs> you see what I mean? So I think uh, the way I try to be is responsible in what I do myself, try to engage with a broader community and initiatives like Labo 1.5. It's really powerful because it shows that we are not just external observers, but we push for being in consistence between what we know and how we operate as scientists 
the opposite uh, gives a sense of dissonance that is very hard to cope with. And then I'm also, um, it, what gives me strength is uh, uh, listening to the younger generations. This is why I really wanted to be here. Um, the way you understand the situation is not the same as the way your parents or your grandparents understand the situation. And what I think we really need is building bridges between generations. Much of the communication about climate change has been focused on you know, professional context or younger people. But now we need to create new partnerships with those who are decision makers, with the generations of those who are in power. And what I saw is the gap between people who are well informed, who have included that in their values, in their visions, who sometimes take radical actions, and those who are like the remnants of the ancient world. <laughs> They have not completely adjusted their views of the world. They try to do little things to look nice, but they do not understand the scale of the transformations to be made, or they even don't know how even to start. So I think we really, really need um, not to oppose visions, but to create bridges and make sure that those now in power um, uh, have an understanding of what to do so that they can change the pace of action. Thank you for the presentation. It was really good uh, and insightful. My question would be uh, something surrounding uh, maybe a continuation of some other uh, some other questions here. Is that um, how do you deal with policymakers when they disproportionately uh, allocate funds or resources to ineffective methods? Like for example, the ocean cleanup project, which has been like completely uh, debunked by almost completely debunked by scientists, but it still happens, and the crowdfunding is still going and, and stuff. So, so how do you deal with this? And, the, and when such projects do happen, it kind of leads to this, um, this distrust in, in, in government action for climate change. And, and I've even seen uh, uh, in, in, in India where, uh, where such uh, ineffective methods ha have led to more climate change skepticism. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Um, <laughs> I was wondering what are the challenges uh, emerging from uh, interdisciplinarity work, <laughs> if any, uh, for instance, uh, between uh, the IPCC and IPBES, or uh, between uh, working groups within the IPCC? Uh, hello. Thank you very much for your presentation. Yeah. Uh, I have a question about like uh, how to engage with the PhD and so on because, uh, for instance, I'm doing research on uh, renewable energy and so on, and sometimes I feel like it's really uh, useless because like we're working on really small things that are not really changing stuff, and uh, we like how the research works. Like we have all the international conference and we taking planes and so on to meet all the people and. We're like, it's okay because we're changing the world and I feel like it's not true. And I don't know how to feel about that, about doing my PhD and trying to change the world, but at the same time I feel like my changes are completely useless and maybe I will be more useful not doing research. So yeah, <laughs> I feel like, what do you think about that? Thank you. Thank you very much for all the work you do and for spending time here with us today. Um, I had two questions. One was you mentioned a three to six time deficit between the cost of the investments and what's available. Um, but we've also seen that there's a wide disparity on um, the effects and the um, causes of emissions. So. Is there also a wide disparity in that deficit? Um, so yeah, it would be great to know. Um, then the second question was really, given the link between energy consumption and better standards of living, given the link between energy consumption and greenhouse gas emission, um, how have the aspirations of developing countries because those are the places that will be most hit, and those are the places who are most likely to, to look to want to use gas 
to provide electricity? How have those been taken into consideration for um, the future scenarios? Thank you. So the first question was about um, um, mainstreaming projects uh, that are ineffective. What I think is that sometimes they just build on what is visible. So you see plastic in the ocean, you think I'll solve the problem, I collect the plastic. You don't think that plastic is a sub-product product of fossil fuels, it's part of the revenues of the fossil fuel industry, where actually there are huge investments in developing the petrochemical uh, capacities, which will imply huge amounts of new plastic. So thinking not in silos, but looking at the big picture is quite critical to understand that. And the plastic industry itself is a, a, a few percent of today's global greenhouse gas emissions, so it matters. And only a fraction of that can be uh, recycled. So we are here facing something that is uh, clearly unsustainable. However, plastic can help alleviate the weight of vehicles. It can also uh, uh, avoid some of the food uh, waste and loss uh, by better storage. And so the issue is uh, um, how to embed uh, um, more radical action in public policies. And there are examples such as w Wanda, for instance, or recently here to uh, ban the use of uh, single-use plastic at least, uh, which is something that works and could be broadened, but it hurts major interests. And in addition to what is visible, plastic pollution, which hurts the feelings of people, so they want to do something and feel better, <laughs> There is everything that is not visible, greenhouse gas emissions, you don't see them. Many people don't have any clue of how much they emit. So anything that can help uh, understand the, the at least the environmental footprint of daily choices or equipment investments is really important to build on the goodwill of people and their intelligence. Um, and I wanted to stress that for the ocean there are multiple changes linked to a changing climate. Marine heat waves, um, acidification, uh, on the coast for ecosystem sea level rise and then a warmer ocean mixes less well so it also uh, decreases the amount of oxygen and this is in fact what matters for uh, marine life uh, in addition to plastic pollution. So I think um, um, making these things more visible this requires lots of mediation, outreach, engagement with society activities. I try myself to do what I can with my uh, age uh, <laughs> skills <laughs> like uh, using Twitter or LinkedIn to try to communicate uh, scientific facts. But your generation, you need to reach out differently. I think you need, to, you need to use the social networks that most people are using, Instagram or even TikTok. I've seen scientists, physical <laughs> scientists, uh, doing extremely abstract research, reaching out to a broad audience of young people and then their families, in fact, through TikTok. And I think this is what we need. We need to find ways to give a voice for science, not as activists, you know, different from NGOs, but as scientists with evidence-based information, fact, something that's traceable, cannot be uh, denied, and find a way to have a, a louder voice, uh, including for useless use of uh, public energy and money. But still, when you clean up, you know, the area where you live, you feel good, and you cannot, uh, you cannot ignore that. I do it sometimes, just picking up the waste uh, ar around the streets where I live, and at the end, you, you, you've done something ridiculous, but it makes you feel useful sometimes. <laughs> then uh, the challenges um, uh, for inter interdisciplinary work. I don't think that uh, this is the major issue at the interface between IPCC and IPBES. Uh, the limiting factor is the number of scientists and the number of scientists who have the time to, in addition to teaching administrative duties, uh, um, developing new knowledge, field work, can be available to contribute to international assessments. So that's really a blocking factor, and, and, if, and you know, it's really the limiting factor, especially on biodiversity and ecosystems. So my experience of interdisciplinarity within IPCC was really great because the governments asked us to start this cycle with a, a report on 1.5 degrees of global warming, where we looked at the impacts and risks, additional or avoided. We looked at uh, uh, the trajectories that could allow to limit warming at low levels, and what would need to be made, and then um, the link with sustainability, in particular um, extreme poverty. So the lens of sustainable development goals was used, uh, and each chapter was interdisciplinary. Not just one chapter for you know, climate scientists and one chapter for, I don't know, those who work on, on, on exposure and vulnerability. It was really integrated. It's hard, it requires to develop a common glossary, 
Um, it's difficult to bring together evidence from different types of literature. So, for instance, you can have the quantitative information from more like the impact or physical uh, or some economical aspects, but then you have the qualitative aspect, you have case studies, you have different ways of, of bringing in different forms of knowledge. Um, for me, this is the major strength I have acquired, um, understanding the need to rely more in particular on social science, um, building on social science to better frame even how we develop uh, the assessment reports, and having this um, a way of looking at what we are doing uh, from a perspective of um, monitoring us as a group of people uh, working together, which is what social sciences uh, uh, help uh, bring on board. So it takes a much uh, larger amount of time, uh, but I think it improves, it improves the depth of the assessment by working across disciplines. And I also think that the earlier you learn this, the better it is. <laughs> Um, I could see it was more challenging for um, the older generation of scientists, more anchored in two specific ways of looking at uh, evidence and knowledge. And now we see um, a young generation of scientists who cannot define in which IPCC working group they belong to because they really work at the interface between these usual working groups. And that shows how the um, way of producing knowledge has also changed. Then there was a question about uh, making sense of uh, a PhD thesis and how the research community operates. You know what was the topic of my PhD thesis? It was modeling uh, the mid-Holocene climate 6,000 years ago <laughs> and, and using paleoclimate information to look at the skills of climate models, a period of uh, called the Green Sahara. It had nothing to do with uh, the world's challenges. It brought no real solution. But for me, it was uh, a way to take three years to have some sort of freedom to dive in into one field with a visibility over three years. It gave me the opportunity to work with scientists around the world, uh, including during some of the meetings, European projects, international meetings, understand the value of collective intelligence, bringing different forms of knowledge as well together, and learning uh, hard <laughs> uh, the, the scientific method. And whatever the topic of a PhD is, um, doing your best, showing it to your colleagues, being criticized like hell because it, in fact for another person it doesn't make sense. <laughs> being forced to revisit how you know you understand your results, um, writing your first draft and the peer review process which is so painful but at the end the outcome is better. <laughs> this is really the scientific method and the process which is hard and requires perseverance of a PhD thesis uh, helps you, whatever you do after that, uh, to bring that uh, um, rigor in uh, uh, the, the, the professional career you will use. And uh, when I meet people in public administrations or the private sector or the finance sector sometimes, um, um, counts, uh, a few elected people, <laughs> only a few, but when I meet people who have a scientific background, I recognize them. And that's the way of using that specific method uh, to uh, better uh, make uh, well-informed decision-making as well. I also recognize them when they are journalists, for instance, or when they are involved in uh, NGOs, by uh, a, a specific uh, way of uh, approaching things uh, which is grounded in the PhD experience. So don't, uh, don't overlook uh, what is not mainly mostly satisfying on the near term, uh, but is shaping the way you are thinking and will help whatever uh, future path you take. Then the finance gaps. <laughs> So the finance gaps, uh, what is striking is that today climate finance is mostly addressing reducing greenhouse gas emissions and about 90%. So it is inadequate for adaptation and in particular for those most vulnerable. And that's a core part of building resilience. Then the finance gap for mitigation is, uh, small, is larger, uh, for instance, for Eastern Europe and developing countries compared to developed countries. And it is largest uh, not just in energy, but in aspects related to land use and uh, um, uh, producing food, etc. So we have a, a visual in the longer reports that maps uh, today's finance gap. And uh, in fact, that visual was removed from the Working Group 3 report. It could not survive the approval because some of the developed countries are challenging the definition between developing and developed. They object to that classification, which was developed several tens of years ago. And if you look at Singapore or South Korea, or maybe even China being counted developing, uh, may look a bit uh, uh, not in phase with today's capacities to act, uh, 
Um, so this is one point that was in fact uh, quite difficult uh, on that figure, but now we have it in the synthesis longer report, it stayed, uh, and it, it can be uh, used uh, also, I think, uh, um, in uh, uh, meetings that are planned this year, specifically on the finance aspect, when it's expected to take place in France in the coming months. It's uh, organized also by the Prime Minister of Bahamas, uh, and I think it, uh, it is expected to uh, uh, make progress in how all the finance um, um, institutions like the World Bank or the development banks uh, can better align uh, the support for development they have with climate resilience and with uh, uh, reducing emissions. You stressed uh, uh, the aspirations of developing countries. What comes out most strongly is technological transfer. Um, um, intellectual property rights uh, act as a barrier for um, faster uptake uh, of the clean technologies. So this is something that comes particularly strongly, in particular from India. Um, and um, I understand that th there's an aspiration to do a leapfrogging, which means not going through the coal pollution, uh, coal power plants, sometimes associated with corruptions and then gas and then something cleaner, but try to adopt as quickly as possible uh, the modern clean technologies like batteries for light vehicles and so on. And Technology transfer is quite critical here. And, and then uh, what the report shows is that giving clean energy access to those that lack basic energy services, like for cooking uh, with issues of air quality indoors, um, in the regions where this is missing, would have almost no implication for global greenhouse gas emissions. So what should be the priority is reducing greenhouse gas emissions where they are super high <laughs> first, and helping those most vulnerable to have basic, uh, basic uh, um, to feel the basic uh, energy needs to live decently. And I think that was here. Uh, you mentioned scenarios, maybe. So there are lots of discussions on how equity is reflected in socioeconomic pathways. Most of the scenarios and pathways assessed in IPCC reports, they are developed by uh, research centers, mostly in the, the global north. Um, so there's a need to have multiple perspectives reflected in these uh, socioeconomic pathways. And one of my French colleagues, Yamina Saheb, she looked at some of the scenarios and she said, well, it's nice if you uh, manage to limit global warming, but in the underlying socioeconomic pathways, the area of uh, uh, living units, you know, uh, houses or flats per person, continues to increase in the US, but it's still the same in India. That's, that cannot work. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for your work. Um, you mentioned the importance of uh, communication, and I would like to ask you, knowing that, for example, people tend to discount rewards that are delayed in time, uh, beyond disseminating uh, knowledge or information through your reports, how, on which levels can we tap to help people turning their, their somehow good intentions into actions? Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I had a question about um, finance. Uh, we are in a growing uh, world, uh, and uh, po the goal of countries is to increase uh, growth and uh, increase capital. And um, the transition, the economy, the it is not compatible with uh, the economy, and uh, industry won't uh, invest in. Uh, Green, uh, greenhouse decrease the technology because they are not uh, making profit with it. So what is your, what is, uh, what do you think about that? Thank you for your nice presentation and discussion. I was wondering, except uh, science, academic research, which jobs can we do after our PhD to help improving the knowledge on climate change or to participate on scientific mediation? Thank you. It was written. Will it work? Yeah. Yes. Um, it was written that there were uh, comments by governments, and what were the typical uh, comments by governments, and what have you seen about it? Questions to ask a question, because afterwards we will have to give the room back exactly at midday. 
so yeah, I've got one as well. Thank you for the pre presentation. Um, so it echoes directly a question that, that has been asked before. So since the 80s or 90s, we live mostly internationally in a neoliberal, neoliberal, neoliberal economy, sorry. Um, and so this kind of economy puts states into co to competition uh, to attract capital. And in fact, this competition is based on the regulation of states. So the more you transform every part of society into a market, the less you tax private sectors and the less regulation there is, the more a state is likely to attract capital. And on the, that's on the one end. And the, on the other end, with climate change and all the facts exposed in IPCC reports and environmental degradations, we do see that there is a urgent need for states to regulate more intensively the human activity to decrease its impacts on environments. And so my question will be, are states even willing to take all degradations if it goes against the economy? So that echoes the previous questions. And in other words, what, which goal will prevail in the incoming years when we think about states and regulations, so climate change or the neoliberal agenda? Thank you. Um, so I, I think the first question was about communication and um, for a long time it has been recognized that scientists have a duty to not just produce knowledge but also share knowledge. So being recognized as um, um, ambassadors of the state on of knowledge. And clearly in my view this is not sufficient now and many colleagues, especially many young colleagues, uh, um, would like to see uh, them being recognized also as actors of transformation not just uh, inside the research world, but also um, working closely with uh, um, local uh, cities around the university or more broadly with society. And um, I choose to use the term actors of transformation because what I still see in society is many people who are uh, well, um, um, much more distant from what I showed today, who uh, struggle to make sense of what they experience, including extremes, um, who perceive that to be um, external to them, and then who perceive transformations, even the slow, na slow ones that are being implemented, uh, to be for them disruptive and imposed. Um, so it, it would seem like they are external spectators, rather than understanding that they can also be actors of transformations uh, with benefits. And so my, my mm, uh, at the moment what I, I'm thinking about is how we can, as scientists, uh, help uh, empower people so that they um, not only understand where we are or the futures that are possible, but more practically how they can be actors of transformations, not only in the, um, what they can do at the individual scale, but more broadly, you know, at the scale of choices made by societies, uh, local communities, or more broadly uh, within uh, societies. So it's not communication, it's much beyond that, I think. Uh, and, and if we don't do it, <laughs> given what we know, uh, given uh, the level of uh, um, education that uh, you have uh, obtained, which is unique in society, who will do it? So my qu it's really the question I have. Um, with the uh, investments society has made into your own education, highest possible education, if we don't see ourselves as these actors of transformation and what I see as the new type of progress, where do should it come from? And uh, CNRS only recently recognized in its ethics committee that uh, reducing the environmental c footprint of uh, research activities is part of our ethics. But I think our ethics is not to stay in an ivory tower, uh, distant from society, and uh, the engagement, which is extremely time consuming, uh, different levels with society should be recognized as part of our work and valued in how we are, uh, you know, how the outcome of a research activity is uh, measured as well. There, was a, a qu there were several questions about the economic uh, uh, situation, um, how the world operates today, uh, with uh, the role of capital growth, uh, profits, um, uh, not accounting for externalities, uh, or uh, the um, uh, neoliberal uh, economic system. I'm not an economist. <laughs> 
So I don't think I'm the right person to answer to these questions. Um, they are complex. Um, the world is also changing, and I think the paradigm that led to today's um, visions of today's mainstream policymakers is in fact uh, um, um, even not in phase with the realities of um, the need for regulation, the need for strategic planification, including for adaptation. And when you look at the socioeconomic pathway narrative, you know, that we use for climate projections, they use very different contrasted narratives. And the worst one, the worst one, is a world with increased nationalism, uh, barriers uh, for the transfer of uh, clean technologies, uh, increased inequalities, and uh, sometimes uh, um, control on markets can increase inequalities, in fact, just access to food or other dimensions. And um, I think they uh, would be an interesting need uh, for a more um, economic theory lecture um, of these uh, shared socioeconomic pathways that are formulated in a very neutral way, like contrasted narratives, uh, and adding reality checks of where the world is now. It is striking that uh, uh, increasingly um, relocation and strategic uh, planning is part of decision making. It was not the case a couple of years ago. And um, it is also striking um, for me um, that there's an increased pressure from society uh, on um, uh, governments uh, with a strong wish um, associated with equity, sustainability. And I see an increasing gap between um, the values of those who take decisions and what I perceive as the expectations of society broadly. The only way to address that is to, I think, uh, also have um, political movements that pick up the state of knowledge that we have and provide narratives and visions in which to project. And for me, the worst frustration is not to see that. <laughs> or to see partial aspects, you know, on, on the keys for sustainable development, looking at that from completely contrasted uh, perspective, like to make a caricature on one side only green growth, on the other side only degrowth. <laughs> While it does not uh, incorporate uh, the, the, the multiple dimensions of what is needed, uh, which includes innovation, which includes uh, um, reducing demand, but in a fair way, <laughs> taking into account equity, and uh, working with ecosystems and, uh, and biodiversity. And particularly striking is the unability in France during political campaigns, presidential or parliament votes, to have a decent democratic debate uh, on what we want to do uh, collectively uh, on reducing emissions, on adaptation to a changing climate. I don't know how, as scientists, we can have a voice for that. I, have, I don't know because I'm not a specialist of political sciences or how society operates. The only thing I can do is try to increase the level, level of knowledge and basic understanding of those in political uh, cabinets, the heads of public administrations, journalists. And I hope really that we can increase the understanding from journalists working in the fields of economy and policy because there are huge gaps now. So it's not a clear answer to your complex questions. But this is because it's not in the hands of me or IPCC or whatever. It's really a core question of societal choices and changing, um, changing the way we make decisions. So maybe now we just uh, present the next slides. I think, I think we have time for like one or two questions. Thank you. Um, so I if I don't mistake, we know the effects of uh, greenhouse gases on the um, climate since the, the 60s. And uh, since, um, since that time, what was the, um, the major surprise of all the um, research effort that we did uh, on uh, climate change? Did we just uh, um, reduce the error bars or w were there very big surprise and uh, especially concerning the retroaction uh, processes. Thank you. First of all, thank you for your very nice uh, uh, presentation. Um, I have a question regarding electrification. 
you s you well said that uh, we have a problem with uh, transportation, which emits a lot of uh, greenhouse gases. Uh, but if we want to go toward electrification, we will need some metals, and some of them are critical. So is there any future there? Uh, can we find a way uh, to, to find this metal and to go through electrification? Thank you. Next one, right. Okay. Thank, thank you uh, for uh, being here. Uh, I have a question about an article that has been released uh, mid-December about the fact that there is more and more methane in the atmosphere and this appeared to be true even in uh, 2020 during lockdown when the country was uh, stopped, like the world was uh, stopped. Uh, and that could be due to the fact that uh, permafrost has started to melt and this would mean that maybe we have already reached a tipping point and has this been taken in account uh, in the ICCP, uh, IPCC report? And what do you think about it? What could we expect? Thank you. Thank you. So um, there was a former question which ad addressed the, issues of the issue of jobs. So just I would like to uh, stress one point. When I was invited to uh, present these findings at the um, uh, French government, one question that arose from some ministers was, we understand there's a need to do things differently, but what can be the political capital we gain? Because taking action, changing pace of action, will disturb some, including voters, for instance. So what are the political benefits? And then there was a discussion between ministers, and what was stressed was that uh, the industry, the location of the industry in the future, um, will depend on clear, long-lasting political support in different regions. China has a long advance for photovoltaic, for wind energy, for uh, battery-powered vehicle, incl including clean ones, small vehicles. The plan from the Biden administration in the US gives a clear uh, investment framework. Some industries that planned to locate in Europe are now moving to the US. And so the issue of having a clear vision, support for, uh, I would say, uh, low-carbon or clean technologies um, will be critical for where the jobs are located. And if we don't do it seriously, with a clear vision, ambition, and allocation of investments in line with the goals, in fact, uh, we'd just be customers of what's being produced elsewhere, <laughs> sometimes with, uh, in fact, uh, higher emissions temporarily, um, instead of doing it with the lowest uh, carbon electricity that can be available. And I think this aspect, which is not exactly what we discussed previously, but the aspect of having a vision of clear transition, strategic planning, including investments, a vision of uh, uh, relocation of industry and jobs, uh, it's quite critical. So uh, the, the companies that will give the same service with uh, um, improved environmental performance, they will have the markets tomorrow. So if you don't create a favorable environment for that, including with a regulation that's the beginning, you'll just lose these companies. <laughs> and so that's also an important aspect which allows um, the private sector uh, to be further engaged in, in, in acting faster now. Um, there was another question about surprises. So when you look back in the, the first uh, um, uh, US ad, um, Academy of Science reports, the Charney report on climate change 1979, uh, you could see the best guess of scientists with limited evidence. And if you look at the last Working Group 1 report, you can see that we have uh, basically reduced now, a long time, by a factor of two, the uncertainty on the climate response, something called climate sensitivity. And this could only be achieved by um, using information from past climate, from more observations of warming, and so forcing and responses, uh, and then better understanding of all the climate uh, feedback loops. So it also shows the timeline of uh, basic research advances, uh, which can be slow, but this really matters, uh, reducing by a factor of two uh, the uncertainty on the climate response. Um, I think what was also surprising was the acceleration of sea level rise, uh, and then the understanding um, that today in the last decades, the fraction of CO2 absorbed by the land and ocean was about the same, 56%, but we see the first signs of saturation of the ocean uh, um, carbonate chemistry. And if warming is large, typically two degrees or more, 
um, there's an increased understanding that the, the efficiency of these things, ocean and land, could be weakened. And that's a major source of uncertainty. Um, in particular, uh, because on the physical side, we only look at part of the story. We don't include ecosystem degradation by local pressures, uh, biological properties, even fire, we don't include it properly. So it could happen earlier, um, and, and it really matters in terms of understanding what is still in our hands. And the more we delay action, um, the more we will need to act if uh, the natural response of the things is less effective. Um, I'll just uh, move to the question about methane. Yes, methane continues to increase in the atmosphere. My understanding is that from the monitoring network that we have, uh, the increase is not driven by uh, the high latitudes now. It is mostly driven by additional sources uh, from uh, tropical areas, in particular wetlands. Um, this is my understanding to date. Uh, the lockdown effect, effect has had a, a complex uh, effect on the emissions of pollutants. Uh, and uh, uh, I don't think uh, this is what uh, will matter most <laughs> for uh, longer term trends. It's like a temporary uh, decrease and then reset. Um, so when you look at um, our emissions of methane, what matters most now are fugitive emissions from fossil fuels. And then in terms of human activities, livestock uh, uh, in the world and meat consumption, basically. And then we are also going to struggle with uh, the effect of emissions from wetland. Um, which is related to uh, interannual climate variability. Um, for permafrost, uh, we have an estimate of how much methane in the future could be released from permafrost, but we need science advances to constrain that better. In particular, because processes of abrupt permafrost thaw are not well incorporated in what we have at the moment. Um, and just uh, maybe to, uh, as a factor, one degree of global warming means 25% less in the area of near-surface Arctic permafrost. So it, give, it gives you at least a sense uh, of uh, what is at play. And finally, electrification. So the Working Group 3 report has a box somewhere, I can't remember in which chapter, on a critical metal for the um, uh, transition, which looks at some of these aspects in a very compact way. There's also a, a UN panel called the International Panel on Resources, which I think is extremely useful uh, to look at the use of non-renewable -re resources in particular. And uh, you mentioned critical material. I think the core one is lithium. Uh, it, they, there's supply that is available. Uh, new batteries now avoid to use cobalt, uh, which is associated with uh, huge concerns for social and environmental aspects. Um, just to say it roughly, um, the pressure will also be on copper uh, due to the development of uh, electricity systems, not just uh, lithium. And then regarding the batteries, there's really a power of regulation uh, so that um, uh, there's a regulation, for instance, on uh, for vehicles, the weight of the ve vehicles, the capacity of the battery to avoid uh, transporting something used only uh, uh, from time to time, so for e efficiency. Um, and there can also be a regulation for second life of batteries uh, as a, uh, um, electricity storage without need for strong power and then for recycling. And the regulatory framework can help uh, uh, make the best use of uh, uh, critical uh, uh, metals, for instance, uh, and avoiding creating um, extra uh, trade-offs or side effects in regions where mining activities will uh, expand, sometimes in context of uh, already strong tensions on the use of water. And so this illustrates that um, there are climate-related risks, but there are also uh, transition risks that need to be uh, incorporated and accounted for uh, if you want to have a, a sustainable, uh, really, uh, way of uh, addressing this. Thank you so much, Valerie. Uh, well, uh, it's clear that all of us, we, we have a, a common interest in climate change, and we are touching it uh, through many fields. So. Uh, this could be the beginning to discuss um, mm, between us, between all of us, um, the all our PhD subjects. So we we create this channel through WhatsApp. Uh, you can zoom up the QR code, and then we're gonna send you a link to share our subjects, to share uh, our ideas, uh, to continue the this discussion uh, between us. 
Uh, so it is the, a good opportunity to 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 know us and to to know what we do uh, after after all this path that we are um, taking. So I would just uh, thank you very much, uh, would like to thank you very much for joining this event. I uh, thank uh, hugely the organizers um, for um, careful planning and, and especially uh, you who have uh, shaped the way uh, the event was uh, built and also uh, having maybe a legacy uh, so that you can also uh, build a dialogue between you. And to finish, I want to flag that um, uh, your voices matter, you know, really. Try to find ways to use them, uh, but don't underestimate the power that you can have uh, as a young scientist in society. Thank you.